It says, immediately, Jesus made his, say it with me, he made his disciples get in the boat. And he sent them to the other side. Yeah. So then it says, what happens? Jesus sends the multitudes away, and then he goes up on a mountain by himself to be alone with his father, to be alone in the spirit, to kind of get, get everything on page and get everything lined up. Now, when evening came, the Lord was alone, but the, boat, but the boat was now in the middle of the lake. So Jesus is looking out over the lake, and he's seeing his disciples, and they're rowing, and they're not really making a lot of progress. And the, the boat was being tossed by wind and waves. And this, I love this statement. Say it with me. The wind was contrary. Everything was blowing against them, right? And so now in the fourth watch of the night, which is sometime around three o'clock in the morning, so they've been rowing a long time. And they're like, man, Jesus has told us, man, we just got to get there. And they're in the middle of the lake in the middle of the night. And these guys are mariners. You got to realize that they grew up on this lake. They grew up fishing this lake. They knew this lake. They knew the weather. They knew the patterns. They knew the currents. They knew everything about this lake. But there was something about the resistance that they were experiencing that wasn't natural to them. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, Jesus goes out walking on the water. And they, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out with fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer, it is I, don't be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you on the water. And the Lord said, come on down, Peter. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind and the waves and the boisterous sea, he became, he became afraid and he began to sink. And he said, Lord, save me. And the Lord stretched out his hand, caught him by the hand, picked him up and said, little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind and the waves ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshiped him and said, truly, you are the son of God. This actually is a reference. What Jesus is doing is he's mirroring. A lot of things that Jesus is doing to this culture in particular is he's mirroring Old Testament to them. I think it's Psalm 32. I can't remember, but it's, it's the Lord walks upon the midst of the seas and he commands the winds and the waves. He's the storm God, right? So they would have known about a God who could walk on the water and command them. And Jesus is like, this isn't fiction. This is reality. I can actually do this, right? So he, he, that, that, would, that was another mirror that they were seeing. So how did they understand that he was the son of God? How did they understand that he was God himself? They even used this reference, son of God. I have a lot of points I want to pull out of this, but I'm trying to keep it disciplined as much as I can. They had a, this, the, the thing I will emphasize, because it's important, the idea of father, son, and spirit is not new. This isn't something that comes only from the New Testament. This was built in to Jewish uh, understanding all the way up to the time of the second temple. During the time of the second temple, the Jews shifted their theology and they got rid of most of almost all their teachings on the, divine, on, on the concept of the divine. Why? Because the, the, their former concepts did nothing but testify of Jesus. They understood Elohim. They understood the divine presence. They understood the divine, pres the, the divine spirit. And they understood the manifest presence of the Elohim. All throughout the Old Testament, you have the manifest presence of the Elohim. You have the God, a manifest presence walking in the garden. Moses, anybody know the story of Moses in the burning bush? Yes. What was in the middle of the burning bush? Anybody know? There was a man in the midst of the burning bush. Read the story. We always do the burning bush. No, there was a dude standing in the middle of the fire. It's Jesus. They understood. So Jesus is the, is the divine. He's the theophany. He's the one that appeared to Abraham. He's the one that appeared to Moses. He's the one that appeared to Joshua before the walls of Jericho, right? He's the one that met Daniel in the fire or the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. So this concept of there being a manifest presence or divine, a separate entity, a separate part of God was nothing new to them. They referred to him as the son or the divine representation. That's how they saw sons. Sons were representations of the Father. And so they would refer to him as the Son. And so Jesus would always speak their language, the Son of God. And in Daniel, he's the, he's the Son of Man. And so Jesus would speak. A lot of these things are Hebraic phrases that he's trying to communicate to this group of people. Do you understand he tries to communicate to you in a way that you'll understand? This God is always wanting to speak to you. We have a class today. God is always wanting to talk to you. And his desire is to try to speak to you in the understanding framework that you have. It's crazy. I'll just tell you a silly story. Um, we went to Valentine's Day with my beloved daughter, and we were sitting there, and you know, and, and my daughter's telling me things, and I'm kind of, I'll use this word, juxtaposed between being a, you know, giving her 
pastoral understanding and being her father. And so I'm kind of twisted up between like giving her what I want to say as her dad and giving her what I want to say as a pastor. And my wife, who sounds very much like the Holy Spirit, said to me, <laughs> counsel her as her pastor, Kevin. And so I'm like, okay. And so whatever, long story, I'm not going to get into all the details, but this is interesting because the point is God desires to speak to you in a language that you understand. And so I kept hearing these, this song by Bob Dylan that I've maybe listened to four or five times in my life. I'm not a Bob Dylan fan. I've never been a Bob Dylan fan, but I kept hearing these times they are a changing, right? I kept hearing these times they are a changing. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, I just hear that these times are a changing. And I said, I think there's something in the lyrics for you that's a word for you. And I don't know what my daughter's music, you know, what she likes at this stage of her life or anything. And she, she, she tells me, Bob Dylan's very important to me. And she tells me all these songs that have meant something to her in her journey uh, in life. And it's been a Bob Dylan song. I didn't even know that. And so here I am, that, so I'm not only geeking out about that, I'm, I'm reading the, 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 the lyrics to her. On her way home, she's calling me, like spam calling me, over and over and over and over again. And finally, I'm like, okay, I'll answer the phone, right? And so I answer the phone, and my daughter's on the phone. She's like, Dad, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. She's like, I'm driving down the road, and there's a dove flying next to my car. She's like, she filmed it. She, she filmed it. She got the end of it. She's like, I'm driving 70 miles an hour, and there's a dove flying next to my car. But wait, there's more. And she said, on my Siri, on her whatever, the satellite radio, is playing The Answer is Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan. I just gave her the word, you know, not even in two hours ago, you know, it's crazy, you know, so it's like God speaks to you in a language that you can understand. This is the point, you know, we think that he's going to speak in these like, you know, you know, oh, they're going to hear a thundering voice and it's going to blow me against the wall and Jesus is going to come through the wall and blind me with light. Not necessarily. He speaks to you and his desire to speak to you is in a communal relationship in a meaningful way. And that's what he does. He tries to speak to you that way. And that's what he's doing right here with these people is he's speaking to them and he's building a bridge into their life off of a language that they would have understood. They would have understood all of the references that he's making, but somehow they, they, they didn't want it. So Jesus sends, him, sends his disciples ahead of them. So there's this concept, Christian, in, um, in this kingdom where they say, you'll hear, you'll have heard something to this effect. I've heard this many times. Well, we don't want to get ahead of the Lord now. We want to slow our roll and we don't want to get out in front of Jesus. That's one. And I've heard that one a thousand times. I've heard the other one. Well, if it's difficult, it may not be the Lord's will. If it's difficult, if it's this hard, you might want to go back and check and see if it's God's will. Well, that dogma, which is the opinions of men, is blown completely out the window through this passage alone. A, Jesus sends them ahead of him. You, you get it? Go ahead of me, which he did multiple times. But this one, he sends them ahead of him and he sends them into difficulty. You mean to tell me Jesus didn't know there was going to be difficulty? Of course he knew there was going to be difficulty. And he sent them in ahead of him into difficulty. And so the question would be, why would he do that? Why would he do that? If you were asking anything of the Lord, if you want, if you don't, you know, so I, a lot of Christians, they don't, they, they can't connect to what I'm saying when I say things like that, because they really don't ever press in or try to ask God or partner with God on anything. So they never see these realities right? They stand as observers and nothing ever functions. Their, their life is nothing but a natural ebb and flow, right? There's nothing supernatural. There's nothing dynamic. And this growth engine that God has created it within us never comes to pass because they want to sit on the sidelines all the time. 